All right, we're here uh, with uh, San Diego County Supervisor Jim Desmond. I'm Miles Himmel, Communications Director for District 5. And uh, we've got a special guest here today from the Hoover Institute, Dr. Scott Atlas, who's been very vocal about uh, opening up businesses and really actually looking at the data around COVID-19. And that's what I wanted to start with, Doctor, is we're sitting here, what is it, July 6th, 7th? What's the data you're seeing with COVID-19? Yeah, well, okay, so the there's a lot of data and unfortunately there's a lot of very superficial thinking about the data. Uh, so uh, we have to be sort of able to understand what's important and what's not. We see that, first of all, the most recent calculations are that the infection fatality rate is far lower than what we originally thought. In fact, the latest data shows that it's 0.04% for people under 70. And what that means is that it's less than or equal to seasonal influenza for everyone under 70. You're not gonna hear much about that because it sort of goes against the fear and panic in the media. It's only sensationalized when it's bad news for some reason, but that's good news. Okay, that's point number one. Point number two is that we have learned who to protect, and that's the very elderly people with serious underlying diseases. And how do I know we've learned to protect them? Okay, we're looking at the data. We knew that early on, half the people almost in the country, it's 43 or so percent, were nursing home patients who died from this. What are we seeing now with these rise in cases? It's actually, I think it's, I'm cautiously optimistic here because we're seeing a lot of cases but we're not seeing any increase in cases in older high-risk people. And we're not seeing any increase in deaths. And these are the people that die. And so we have to look at this cases focus very carefully with what I would basically say is critical thinking here, okay? It is not, it never was, and it never can be a policy goal to stop all COVID-19 infections. That's neither rational when there is a contagious disease present, nor is it necessary. It is only necessary to make sure that this, the very high risk group doesn't get infected. And we're being very successful with that. In fact, it's, it's sort of remarkable if you look at the numbers of the increase in cases, which is of course expected, and I'll tell you why in a second, the, incre the dramatic increase in cases and no increase in deaths, even though, yes, we still have to wait to have the final word on this. But right now, we're talking over a month of increased cases, okay? The date of increased cases corresponded basically to the first week or so of June. That corresponds to the big protest marches. It does not correspond in any way, no matter how many people claim it does, because they're not looking. It does not correspond time-wise to any states that have had any kind of relaxed openings. The relaxed openings are months, six to eight weeks ago already. The timeline of getting an infection is much sooner than that after exposure. We know this, this is not even arguable anymore. So the timeline basically corresponds to social mingling, mainly from the thousands and thousands of protesters marching, Okay, the good news is the overwhelming majority are younger, healthier people. In Florida, for instance, the average age is 36. The average age two months ago of COVID-19 infection cases was 65. So, I mean, this is, now, is this bad or good? It's fantastic. Why is it fantastic? Because it shows A, we're protecting the high-risk group, and B, we know it is not arguable. We know, proven all over the world, whether it's the United States, Europe, Asia, repeatedly, that, health, that healthy younger people have very low risk with this infection, very low risk of getting super sick and very, very low risk of dying. And we know this, it doesn't have, it shouldn't have to be argued anymore. And so uh, the reality is that we're seeing healthier, younger people get the infection. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, first of all, uh, we want to make sure that we're not having uh, them transmit to the high-risk group. I said there's no evidence that they are, partly because we've learned and we know how to all these things to do about protecting these high-risk people. 
Uh, we also know that high risk, that low risk younger people deal with this infection. In fact, the, you know, it's been receiving a lot of pushback, but the reality is that 98, 99% of people infected recover. Okay, that's a fact that doesn't have to be argued anymore. We don't need to protect people, younger, healthier people, who are not gonna have a problem with the infection. We don't isolate people because of the flu. We don't do that. These people have a less than or equal to risk of a serious complication from this than they do from the flu. So, uh, you know, we have to be rational here. There's a positive to having low risk groups get infection. What's the positive? This is how you develop population-based immunity. When I said this months ago, as did others, if we isolate every human being from social interaction, we are prolonging the problem. We are preventing population immunity from developing. But once we've isolated, and this is what we had called for, isolating, protecting the high risk group, once we do that successfully, we don't care if younger, healthier people get the infection. Yeah. It's Doctor, actually a positive. Let me, one second, I want to interrupt you and just kind of swing it on over to Supervisor Desmond here for a second. Is that kind of what you're seeing with the latest numbers here in San Diego as well? Well, yes. And, and, and Doctor, it's, you know, it's just fascinating, you know, hearing, hearing your, your, your input on, on this because it's, you know, very similar, you know, to what's going on in the country and, and even here in San Diego County. You know, we keep hearing more and more and more cases, but we don't really hear how many of those cases are symptomatic or not. You know, and, and so, it, and we do see, we did see our hospitalization tick up a little bit, but the death rate has, has actually been subsiding since about mid-May for us in San Diego County. And so I've been a big advocate of trying to get the businesses open and getting people back to work again. Unfortunately, we, San Diego County, we just got put again on the naughty list, I guess I'll say that for the state of California, where the governor came out and said there was 19 counties in the, in the state of California that uh, had tripped certain triggers. And uh, we in San Diego County actually tripped those triggers, those same ones over this last holiday weekend. I was hoping many people wouldn't go get tested on, uh, on the 4th of July, but apparently enough did. Uh, but, but it's really just the number of cases, not really what the illness is really doing to people. And That's one right. of the pushbacks I get on that, and you mentioned it, I don't know if you could expound on it a little bit, is I keep hearing, well, there's a lag. There's always a lag. And, and it's like, well, we've been hearing about a lag since April 15th. So how much more of a lag, you know, you know, with all these increased numbers and, and decreased deaths, that to me that means the hospitals are doing a pretty good job or a lot better job than they did before. So what about this lag thing that, that's always the pushback? So, so there, okay, there, there is a lag and the lag uh, has to be respected and we have to be cautiously optimistic here rather than just declare this is a slam dunk game over. On the other hand, we want to, I want to pick up on a couple of specific parts of that question that you just asked, which is, okay, first of all, we know the hospital mortality rate is way down from what it was. Mm -hmm. How do, uh, and so what does that mean? Well, first of all, we're much better at treating it. For instance, we know that certain steroids are very helpful early on uh, as, as one of the different changes in the, one of the changes in treatment, but the hospital uh, mortality rate is much lower. The hospital length of stay is about one half. That means that people who are hospitalized are not translating into the super sick outcomes that we used to have. And when we look at the numbers, and I did look at the numbers in San Diego, by the way, and it's true that your cases are going way up, but as you said, the death rates are not going up at all. Uh, this is great news, but also I think we need to put into perspective because it sort of, it, it, it sort of gets steamrolled into all the states and the cases and the hysteria sort of progresses. We look at the hospitalizations, okay, and I did this in detail. I mean, I do it multiple times a day, but today I did it again. And when we look at, let's just take, it's not, it's not available in every state, so we have to go where the data is. We look at the hospitalizations in Arizona, okay? This is in the news. We look at the hospitalizations. I'm looking at their own data here. And when they say, they give a percent of people who actually have symptoms of COVID-19 in their hospitals. And when you calculate that and the number of beds that those people occupy, and then you calculate the number of beds occupied by what they call COVID-19 hospitalizations, it turns out that oh, about 60% of what they have categorized in Arizona 
as COVID-19 hospitalizations are hospitalized for something other than COVID-19. What well, do I mean by that? It means that they're, they're testing all the patients, which is appropriate, uh, it's a fine, and uh, they're testing positive, but that has nothing to do with the hospitalization. And so it's a, it's a gross sort of, it's a misleading statement to talk about how many hospitalizations. We have to be very careful here because when people are loose with the language, they're inciting hysteria. And that fear is not just instilled into the public, it's instilled into, frankly, political leaders who don't have perhaps the time, more likely the inclination or the education or the background to actually use some critical thinking when you're looking at these numbers. So when we look at the hospitalizations that are COVID-19, and I know in Florida, it's something like 20% to 30% or more of Florida hospitalizations are with COVID-19 positive tests rather than from COVID-19. Yeah. It's very important to, to, to tell, I think, your constituents because everyone's afraid when they hear the next sensationalized headline without any real understanding or analysis by people who are willing to do anything beyond the most superficial reaction. Well, and one of the things about our hospitalizations are we get, we get the total number. We say, well, our hospitals are at 65% capacity. Well, and that's about 4,000 patients throughout all of San Diego County, but only about 10 or 15% of that 4,000 are COVID hospitalizations. Yeah, I have something to back you up on that. Again, this is a nationally relevant discussion as well as for San Diego community. I looked at the, the data that's very detailed on the Texas website and the Texas, uh, they have the hospital zones. And I went to the most crowded hospital zones in the state of Texas and I looked at them and exactly what you just said is true. When you calculate it out, 15%, maybe maximum 20% of the hospital beds in the most crowded hospitals in Texas, 15 to 20% are COVID-19 patients. Well, 85% are non-COVID patients in yeah. the hospitals that are the most crowded. So there's this sort of, again, like, I, I don't know if people want to believe the worst case scenario or if they simply are incapable of looking beyond the first headline. I, I don't want to impute anyone's motives, but I think it's, it's very harmful when people don't understand what the numbers really mean. Well, and, and people, and, you know, numbers, everybody uses numbers to fool each other, I guess, in, in some cases, but it, it just appears that, you know, we don't, we don't get the full picture always, you know, particularly when, you know, you hear the percentage of capacities and, and things like that, and people that have the, have the virus or are testing for the virus or which ones are symptomatic, which ones are not symptomatic. It really makes a big difference. In particular, what I've been pushing for is trying to make sure our economy stays open. And, and we're going in kind of fits and starts right now. We're today in San Diego County or at midnight tonight, we're going to be closing down restaurants unless they serve outside. So they, yeah. they can't have any indoor dining, they can have outdoor dining. And so we're getting more and more restrictions, but based primarily on the number of cases that we're getting that are testing positive. And to me, that doesn't necessarily tell the whole picture, but politics and, and everything else aside, uh, people people want, you know, his, his stereo, bad news sells newspapers. And that's true. As, as we know, and that's what they want to sensationalize and, 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 and uh, go after. But, you know, one of the things, you know, so what do you think, what there is, where do you get the data, I guess, because I've yet to find it, on the shorter hospital stays? Because, I don't know, the hospitals have to themselves release that, or where do you, where do you get that information? Yeah, th this sort of data, at least at this point, has to be from the, uh, the hospital heads themselves and the chains yeah. of hospitals themselves. Uh, and that's true. Uh, I, I have that data from various sources, including uh, Florida, but also outside the U.S., by the way. It's, it's also consistent with what's going on in the world. You know, I mean, we are, we are not alone here. We can look at other people's experience uh, and see what's happened. And, and by the way, I think it's very important for people to realize that the correlation to the timing of the cases has nothing to do with this slight minimal reopening uh, that has happened in the United States. And we also know that time-wise it doesn't fit, but also we don't see that in all the other countries that have opened either. We don't have to look at this and say, oh, wow, I mean, uh, we don't know what's going on. Well, we do know what's going on. We know that countries like Switzerland, Sweden, the Netherlands, France, Italy, Spain, Belgium, on and on, 
have, have had more open uh, interactive uh, communities and they have not had a significant problem. We don't need to be the trailblazer and guess here. We know what happens. And when we see what we're getting here, we understand, and, and although public officials somehow make, you're one of the rarities, I think, who understands that there's a harm of the policy itself. And when you look at the harm of the policy itself, it puts things into perspective here. You know, I mean, uh, if you wanna eliminate all infections, okay, everyone must stay inside the rest of their lives and wear an oxygen tank, you're not gonna get any infections. Okay, but there's some trade-offs we're not willing to make there. And that's, uh, that's sort of said just as an exaggeration to, to make up the point that when we have harms of economic lockdown and, and school closure, what does that mean? Okay, well, we know, for instance, that people get economic problems and they have serious problems. We know there's a massive increase in the suicide hotline number calls. We know there's a significant increase in the opioid deaths. Abruptly, in March and April and May, we know that there's also a, a, a significant problem with locking schools down, even though children have virtually zero risk from anything with this. Uh, and we know that teachers are, are a young profession, but when we look at the school closures, I don't know why we're, we're not prioritizing the children. There's massive harms here from not having school. Yeah. Distance learning doesn't work. Half the kids in Boston didn't even sign on on any given day. There's a 30% drop in reading level from distance learning. But the most important thing that our children learn from school is from social interaction, group activity, learning how to mature socially, uh, and not just those kinds of things and physical activity, but also schools are where children learn. We learn that they need a hearing aid or they need glasses. And what's even worse and totally not talked about here is that the number one agency that reports child abuse is the school. And if you close schools, you're not seeing this. We know that child abuse is dramatically increasing, by the way, because of the lockdown and because of the unemployment. We know it not just from what usually happens, but we also know that 35% increase in serious child abuse visits to the pediatric emergency rooms, 35% increase. This is not just someone who slapped their kid in the face. This is some people, these are parents who think they may have killed their child or their child has a problem breathing. And I'm, I'm sorry to be graphic, but this is, very important for people to understand. The consequences of closing schools are enormous. The consequences of having people who make up to $50,000 or forty dollars to $50,000 a year, half of them have lost their jobs. Yeah. I mean, these are enormous complications. Not everyone has a second home in La Jolla that they can just hire somebody and help their kid tutor their kid. I mean, you know, this is very impactful. You're just, people are destroying families and a future generation here because they're afraid. The data doesn't support that. Otherwise, we would shut down the schools every flu season from November to April because the flu has a higher risk for people under 70 than COVID-19. Wow, that's, no, that's incredible. And, and it's, it's very true about you know, the schools. I, I agree with you as far as getting the kids to interact. And, and my daughter's a school teacher and she can tell when you know, some kid starts wearing gang clothes or, or things like that, or they, if they're being affected, or if they can tell if their parents are, are helping them with homework or not. And it, it's, you know, the school is, is a, you know, a great socialization uh, um, factor as far as, as far as kids are concerned. So I 100% agree with you. One of the things, I don't even know if this concept is really holds true, but one of the things we've, our numbers have held pretty much steady about 4% of, of wh whatever number we test in San Diego County, about 4% test positive. Some days it's 8%, some days it's six, some days it's two, but about 4%. Is it safe to say that at any one, if we were to test everybody all in one day, that 4% of the population would have it or, or not? I'm just trying to figure that. If that uh, it, it's, hard, it's hard to guess, but I'll give you a couple of pieces of information. Uh, the CDC itself estimated that we're off by more than a factor of 10 in how many people have the infection. Even the CDC understands that there's a massive number. There are tens of millions of Americans with the infection. Now, that said, the, the lockdown, the social isolation, undoubtedly prevented some people from getting it, although there's good data to say that the lockdown was actually too late. But in any event, uh, 
people get it. I think that what, here, here's the real importance of the question. We can't say exactly how many people have had the infection, but we can say this. The estimates to get what's called herd immunity, population immunity, were way off. How do I know? Because when you actually look at the science, it turns out, A, there's a peak on the number of people in a closed population that get the infection. Okay, yeah. the, the original ship, if you remember, was called the uh, Diamond Princess, I think. And oh. even in that setting, that closed ship, they tested everybody. There was no social distancing. This is before any of that was known. And only 24% of people got the infection. Why is that if it's such a contagious disease? The reason is because there is immunity. There is already existing immunity from either other coronavirus infections or related uh, infections. And so when you get uh, a testing done, and there's good data that says that, you know, we know about the antibody test, that all this technical stuff is in the common narrative now, but uh, I don't wanna be boring, but there's another type of immunity that's called T cell immunity, it has nothing to do with antibodies. So even though the way we say who had the test, we, who had the infection, is by testing from antibodies. Those are the numbers you're referring to, or maybe you're referring to the virus testing, but be the, the virus whatever testing. way, uh, when we say that, okay, 10% of people have antibodies. In New York, 21% of people in New York City have antibodies. There's another larger group of people that have immunity from their T cell response. This is all in the data, but it's not spoken about yeah. on TV. And so we know that there's a, actually, there's a, there's a pretty good chance that herd immunity requires way less infections because there's existing immunity out there and require, and actually may have already been reached in a place like New York. We don't know, but it's possible. So uh, it all says that these figures and projections and models were wrong. They were grossly wrong. They're repeatedly wrong. And the ones that were the most wrong are still relied on in many cases, like the IHME model. And so we have to be very careful. Let's focus on the evidence. Let's reassure everyone that we know what we're talking about here. We have the evidence. There's sort of a logical pathway here when we understand it's not just the number of cases, it's who gets the case, who gets sick, how are they dealing with it? And if we can keep protecting the people who are at high risk, we're in good shape here. Well, do you think we're on a downward trend then? Because the, the most uh, vulnerable, the elder, elderly, are, are getting, you know, are, are not testing it positive at the numbers they were before, and now it's more people. For us, the average age is now 40 in San Diego County. Right. So is it, is it a downward trend to see that the younger people are testing more now more positive than, than the most vulnerable, or, or is it, I don't know if that's a trend at all? Well, I think what we can say is that there is more social mingling, I mean, you know, whether it's due to the protests or not or a separate discussion, but it's obviously due to the marches uh, to a great extent. But okay, there's, there's more social mingling of younger, healthier people than there was before, because most of the people that were mingling at the social, at the uh, marches were younger people from looking at it on TV. I don't have yeah. data on that, but it seems obvious. And so uh, they had a lot of proximity to each other. They were screaming together. They were using the same megaphones. I mean, this is obvious ways that infection could spread. That's okay as long as they get it. But this is why there's younger people and we're isolating, we're better at isolating the older people. Uh, I would say something very interesting in, in that it, it used to be that there was a very high mortality rate in the older people in the nursing homes when they're tested positive. Yes. The latest data on nursing home testing is that you know 70% plus or minus a few percent are asymptomatic even with new infections in nursing homes. So this implies something else is going on. It implies perhaps that the virus is, is not as, uh, as lethal in and of itself, because as we know, viruses change, they mutate. And frankly, the, the one way that viruses sort of go fizzle out is by mutations that make them less problematic, not more problematic, less problematic. Oh, that's good. So this that's is another, sort of piece of good news is that older people, we're not seeing deaths go up, we're seeing them go down. Older people are not the people who are uh, getting this new wave of infections. And you know, we're, I feel like you know, we're in good shape here as long as we focus on what's important about these numbers. All right, well, uh, Miles, we're almost out of time here. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what I was gonna kind of leave you with because I know uh, both of you have to run here, but Dr. Atlas, what's a, a kind of a final thought for people here in San Diego County or, or, or different places that maybe read the headlines and are worried or, or think there's something, leave them with a final thought. 
yeah, I think the final thought is, you know, be, be careful in your reaction. Try to delve a little deeper and, and focus on the important points of who's getting these cases. And I, and I would say, frankly, that, you know, if there are people that are so afraid that they don't want to, they don't want to go out, then don't go out. Okay, but the, uh, frankly, you know, honestly, the rest of us, we need to live. The country is committing, honestly, national suicide if you continue this lockdown. It's a very harmful policy. It's really harmful to the children. It's extraordinarily harmful to people economically, and it translates into life years lost. And we're creating unnecessarily a massive problem that is bigger, a bigger problem than the infection itself. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I appreciate you standing up, both of you guys, and, uh, and we'll talk soon. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.